morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you here to this year's Osler, Austin and Harcourt uh, LLP Business Law Forum. Um, I'd like to acknowledge and thank Oslers for the generosity in uh, funding the forum which makes this lecture possible. This is the 11th annual Osler Lecture, and its purpose is to foster an exchange of ideas about business law um, within the community, within the law school community, and in the broader community. Um, and our aim is to attract leading scholars in the business law field, and we've certainly been able to do that this year. We're pleased to welcome Professor Ken Greenfield. He's Professor of Law and Law School Fund Distinguished Scholar at Boston College Law School. Welcome to Dalhousie and to the Shoemaker School of Law. Professor Greenfield, you managed to get here between weather events, which I think is, is great. A good timing for us in any event, and I hope uh, for you when you turn around to head back. Um, Professor Greenfield's lecture is entitled Corporate Citizenship, Friend or Foe. And I'm going to ask Professor Rothman to introduce him and to tell you just a little bit more about his research and his background. Welcome, everybody. I'm really pleased to introduce Ken Greenfield today. Uh, I have the pleasure of uh, having known Ken for over 10 years, and uh, I'm sure he has something really interesting and insightful, as he always does. But I'd like to say a little bit about him, just to give you some, some background, some context into uh, his distinguished career. As Camille had mentioned to you, that uh, Kent's title is a Law Fund Research Scholar at Boston College Law School. That he teaches and writes in the area of business law, constitutional law, decision making theory, legal theory, and economic analysis of law. He clerked for Justice Souter at the U.S. Supreme Court after clerking at the Federal Court of Appeal and has been teaching, uh, for, or sorry, the uh, First Circuit. Sorry, I know we, we don't have circuits here, so I get a little confused <laughs> with, with that. Sometimes I'll leave that out. But um, he's been teaching at Boston College since 1995. He's also visited at a number of law schools, for example, the University of Connecticut School of Law, uh, 2002. He was the visiting Wallace S. Fujiyama professor at the University of Hawaii, William S. Richardson School of Law in 2005, and a visiting professor of political science at Brown University in 2006. From 2007 to 2008, he was the distinguished faculty fellow uh, at the Center on Corporations, Law, and Society at the Seattle University School of Law. And he's also a past chair of the section on business associations at the American Association of Law Schools. Kent is the author of two prominent books, The Myth of Choice, Personal Responsibility in a World of Limits, as well as The Failure of Corporate Law, Fundamental Flaws, and Progressive Possibilities. He's also written numerous articles and various commentaries, editorials, essays in law reviews and newspapers. And we're fortunate to be able to get Kent here on, uh, for what is often a very busy schedule that he has when he's lecturing. He's lectured in 36 states, nine countries, and at over 100 institutions. And now he can add Dalhousie to that list. He's also written a number of op-eds in places like the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Boston Globe, the Atlantic, the Washington Monthly, American Prospect, Salon, and The Nation. And as I've said, I've known, I've had the pleasure of knowing, uh, knowing Kent for more than 10 years. And <coughs> we always have really interesting conversations and he always seems to be working on something really new and intriguing, so I'm quite interested to, to hear his talk today, which as Camille has introduced, is called Corporate Citizenship, Friend or Foe. And with that, I'd like to give a warm welcome to Ken Greenfield. Welcome, everybody. I, I, uh, I will try to do, make this as informal as as possible, we, we've got, um, I was asked 
to uh, speak for about an hour. Um, so, and I know that uh, the average human takes about seven minutes to go to sleep. So if you, if you start now, you can get, you get like 60 good minutes of nap time in. Um, but, if, but if you choose not to, not to nap, uh, I'm going to talk about the, uh, a, a topic that I, th that I find to be uh, quite fascinating and important, the topic of corporate citizenship. But first I should, I should um, thank Dean Cameron for uh, inviting me to come, my old friend uh, Dr. Rotman for, for his hand in, in inviting me in his, in his, in his, in, uh, for his intellectual leadership in this way. Um, and in our field. So if, can you hear me if I'm, if I'm here rather than back there? Um, so I'm a bit of an odd duck even for a law professor um, in that I have, have studied and written on both about constitutional law and the, the law of rights and obligations from a public law perspective and also about business law, which we think of as a private law field. So, and not many people uh, do that, or, or, but it, it has given me an opportunity to see things from both sides of that divide, which I, I, I actually think is a false one, but it's one that pervades at least U.S. law. And so one of the things that, uh, one of the areas in which that this is, uh, that this divide uh, seems to, uh, seems to make a difference is in the area of corporate citizenship. For some people, corporate citizenship is a goal, something we should pursue. For other people, it seems to be the worst possible way to run a democracy, to think of corporations as citizens. And so my talk today is to, is to try to flesh this out, whether corporate citizenship is a goal or something we should oppose. Is it friend or foe. And I think this is both fascinating and important. It's fascinating because, um, because of this divide and this difference of opinion among scholars and, and activists, practitioners, uh, public policy experts, and it's important. The rules that we use to govern large corporations are in some ways more important than the rules that we use to govern our states, our provinces, our localities, even our nation. Just one example, right? The, um, Walmart, the big U.S.-based uh, you know, big box store, it's two, over two million employees. It's chartered in Delaware. Delaware has less than a million people in Delaware. So the rules that Delaware provides for the governance of Walmart are actually more impactful than the rules that Delaware provides for its own citizenry. So I think these things are, can be quite important. So, um, so here's what I'm going to do. So I, I've got, um, I'm going to tell you about, I have a talk today in four chapters. So chapter one is going to be history. Chapter two is going to be a bit of theory. Chapter three is going to be uh, gymnastics, uh, intellectual gymnastics, ideological gymnastics, talking about a flip that has happened ideologically. And chapter four will be a defense of corporate personhood and corporate citizenship. So, and one other, before I start, one other thing to say is that, so because of who I am, most of my uh, knowledge is from the U.S. perspective, but I think the, the, the question the issues are important for any constitutional democracy, including Canada. And one of the things that we can talk about when we, we talk together at the end of my talk is, is where are there differences between the U.S. and Canada in this and uh, other nations. So, chapter one. So in 1882, uh, two trains collided in the Fourth Avenue Bridge, Fourth Avenue Tunnel in New York City. Injuring, uh, killing two passengers and injuring hundreds. Now, many New Yorkers blamed this man, uh, William Henry Vanderbilt, who owned the railroads, and said that he had, um, 
skirted and had its short changed safety measures in order to maximize his profit. And they accused him of being too profit oriented. Now at the time Vanderbilt was, was among the most powerful people in the world. He was by his own account the richest man in the United States at the time. So this is 1885 or so, 1886. So this was a, an era where $1,000 a year was a decent wage. His investments spun off interest income of a million dollars a month. At the end of his life, he said he would not cross the street for another million dollars. He was that rich. But he, he, he knew what he was doing when it came to running a railroad. He wasn't a very good caretaker of his public image, though. So the, the week after the trains collided, killing two and injuring hundreds, and, um, an impertinent reporter got into his private dining car on one of his railroads as it was traveling from New York to Chicago. And he asked Vanderbilt whether, in his view, he managed his railroad with an eye toward public benefit. His response was, became famous because it encapsulated the view of the Gilded Age obligations of corporations. What he said, what he yelled at the reporter was, the public be damned. So he basically was giving the middle finger to the U.S. public uh, in this. And in fact, it, that phrase, the public be damned, showed up on the front pages of hundreds of U.S. newspapers within 24 hours. A magazine ran this, this satirical uh, cartoon of him soon thereafter, leaning back, smoking a stogie, with his foot on America, with his uh, lap dogs, you can't see it, on, on one called Congress, one called Legislature, but he uh, was in control. And in fact, his statement, the public be damned, encapsulated the Gilded Age view of what corporations were for. They were not to be run for the public. And, in, and for the most part, the law was his ally. There was little regulatory protection during the Gilded Age for workers, for communities, for laborers, or the environment. And this uh, protection of corporate prerogative even had, a, in the U.S., had a constitutional footing and constitutional basis. Because in 1905, the Supreme Court decided one of its most pivotal cases in a case called Lochner v. New York, where it struck down a, uh, a New York statute limiting the number of hours that bakers could work. That sounds inconsequential, right? It was, it was one of the early attempts by the, the early nascent progressive movement to, to protect employees and workers, mostly immigrants, in the baking industry. And it was a part of a broader range of progressive initiatives in the U.S. But the United States Supreme Court struck that law down on constitutional grounds saying that the freedom of contract was a liberty protected by the 14th Amendment. 14th Amendment's protection of due process, substantive due process. Saying that the freedom of contract was a fundamental right. And so what that did in 1905 was to instill the free market as a constitutional good, as a constitutional um, value. So the, the power and prerogative of business was constitutionally protected. So this, so this age, this Lochner era age, protected the prerogatives of business. Now we now know that the, that the, court, the Supreme Court's assumptions about freedom of contract were misguided, right? The freedom is not just freedom from regulation. We now, the court ignored the coercion inherent in the market, the coercion inherent in the deadening crush of poverty and squalor. 
But what Lochner did was to move corporate issues, corporate prerogatives, corporate rights to the center of constitutional protections. Workers, employees, communities would have to protect themselves in the market without the assistance of law. So this Lochner era lasted for a generation or so in the U.S. But constitutional law was not the only problem. This same protection of, of corporate interest also attached in corporate law, in the private side of the divide. You had the public part, part of the divide, Lochner, protecting corporate prerogatives by constitutional means. And in, the, and in corporate law, they face the same question. What obligations should corporations have in society? And in effect, the courts answered it in the same way, although using different language and different um, uh, principles, but came out the same way. Now, the key case in the U.S. on this had to do with Henry Ford and the Dodge brothers. Now, this is Henry Ford. Um, now, this is in the second decade of the 20th century, Henry Ford was making an incredible fortune of money. Ford Motor Company, the company in which he was the dominant shareholder, was turning out the Model T, pictured there, and was transforming the country. And they were amassing, he and his partners were amassing a, an incredible fortune of money. Now, Ford Motor Company had been created with a capital um, of $100,000 in 1903. 13 years later, by 1916, it was valued at $60 million. So they transformed an investment of $100,000 into $60 million. The shareholders were making enough every, uh, were, 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 were making so much that they were getting a 100% return on their investment every month. They were making a lot of money. The company was also issuing and declaring special dividends, which was magnifying that, those returns even more, as much as $11 million in 1914. Now, now we know that Henry Ford was not such a good guy, right? We know he, he was an anti-Semite. He, uh, he funded Hitler. He was uh, an apologist for the Third Reich. But in the teens and 20s, he was actually a progressive hero. He cultivated, like, in contrast to Vanderbilt, Ford cultivated a benevolent image. He made headlines by, um, by paying his workers $5 a day, which was twice the market rate. And he said at the time that he did that because he wanted Ford Motor Company, the purpose of Ford Motor Company, to improve the lives of the working class. And he, he sounded radical indeed. Here's his quote. He, he was quoted in the New York Times, and here's his quote. I believe it is better for the nation and far better for humanity that between 20,000 and 30,000 people should be contented and well-fed than that a few millionaires should be made. So this played really well in the public, right? He was, he was like the good businessman. And as I said, it made him somewhat of a, of a um, hero among American political radicals. Now you guys are too young to remember this movie. Uh, there's this movie um, about journalist John Reed called Reds. Do you ever see Reds? Reds? Well, uh, so John Reed, who was this com sort of famous communist, communist journalist radical in the U.S., he, like, um, he idolized Ford. So that, that's how left Ford seemed at the time. Now in 1916, Ford declared that, that the special dividends that, he had been, that the company had been declaring, he declared that the, those special dividends would come to an end. He needed the money to build a new factory that was going, he wanted to be the largest in the world. And he claimed, brashly again, that his real purpose was 
uh, to do social good for the company's employees and customers. And he argued that shareholder gain was a byproduct of a successful business, not its purpose. He thought that the satisfying the obligations of a robust social contract was what a business was about. Now this did not go over so well with the shareholders. Right? The shareholders dis thought this was quite offensive. And his, two of his principal shareholders were the Dodge brothers. Now they had invested $10,000 in Ford Motor Company at, at its initial founding. So they owned 10% of the company with $10,000. They had, at this point, made 40,000% back return on their $10,000 in initial investment. But they were angry at Ford and sued in Michigan court to require Ford to issue these special dividends. Now, in a way, this was a crafty demand. It was pretty sly. Um, why? Because Dodge, the Dodge brothers, had started their own company, Dodge Chrysler, right? We now know it's Dodge Chrysler. And so by, if, he could, if they could get the company, the court, to require Ford to pay them money, it would, it would give them money to invest in their own factory and, and also take money out of Ford's coffers. So it was pretty crafty. And Henry Ford understood that. He had no reason to fill the Dodge brothers' pockets, and he had numerous solid business re reasons to keep the money in-house. And if he had said that, he, the court would have completely deferred to him. Right? Courts do that. Courts defer to rational business judgments. But he didn't say that. What he said was that he wanted to keep the money to benefit employees, customers, and the community. And the Dodge brothers said, wait, hey, we can't let that, uh, the court, they said to the court, you can't let that happen. And it eventually did make it to the Michigan Supreme Court. And you'll remember, this is a moment where socialism was on the rise in, in the US. The Russian Revolution uh, had already begun. So these notions of sort of these, ra these radical, seemingly socialist um, words coming out of, of Ford's mouth could not be countenanced by the court. And so there's this famous case that, at least in the US case books, is one of the first cases you read in the basic corporate law. It's Dodge v. Ford. So there's Dodge v. Ford, right? Um, I'm more of a Ford person myself. Uh, but, but, so Dodge v. Ford is one of the first cases that, you, that we read in the U.S. Um, and, and it still is taken, even though it doesn't control in, in, in any meaningful sense, it's an old case, it's uh, almost 100 years old, but the black letter law is still often taken from the quote from Dodge v. Ford, which is this. A business corporation is organized and carried on primarily for the profit of the stockholders. The powers of the directors are to be employed for that end. So the court ordered Ford to, to um, issue the, and the dividend. And this case is still cited, like I said, as one of the most important cases defining the obligations of corporations. Now, rarely, uh, just because most people don't do both corporate and constitutional law, rarely, these, rarely do you see Lochner and Dodge v. Ford put together. But they're part and parcel of the same era. Part and parcel of a sense that on both the private side and the public side, corporations are not citizens. They don't have public obligations. The public be damned was not just an epithet, from a frustrated magnate, but it, what, but it was the law's doctrinal touchstone on both the corporate and the constitutional side. Now, so this is one of the things I want to talk about today, how these pendulums are swinging together, the constitutional sense of, of corporate citizenship and the, and the private sense. So let me, let me 
uh, speed through some history. So this change on both the corporate side and the constitutional side uh, around the New Deal in the U.S. I mean, the economic calamity that the New Deal um, uh, uh, posed showed that uh, caused the Supreme Court to rethink its notion of what freedom was and what coercion was, and so it overturned Lochner. Meanwhile, in corporate law too, uh, very important reconceptualizing of the of the corporation was happening. The most important um, and influential book in the history of corporate governance, the modern corporation and public property by Gardner Means and Adolf Burrow. This is Adolf Burrow. Someday I will have like such a dignified picture overlooking New York or something. Um, but this is what law professors used to look like, I guess. Um, Right, but so, but he, but Burl, um, Burley and Means uh, argued that because of the separation of ownership and control, shareholders had really lost their claim on, on, um, on the corporate uh, fisc, and what corporations should instead be managed um, to do was to take account of uh, and with reference to the public good. He said that all publicly held business corporations were public trustees with powers to be exercised for the benefit of the community. So both on the corporate side and the constitutional side, the New Deal changed everything. Now, in, in broad strokes, this, is, this is, was the rule in, on both the public and the private side for corporations for most of the 20th century in the United States. So you had the Lochner era, the Dodge v. Ford era, change in the New Deal, and that lasted for some time. Now, um, there were some, it fits and starts, obviously, but the, uh, that was pretty much the rule, at least um, even through the 70s. Now, the 70, 1970s had a lot of bad ideas in it. Uh, 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 one piece leisure suits, the Bee Gees, uh, the, the 70s were bad in a lot of ways. Uh, the seven, even, but in the law, it wasn't so bad. Like, uh, activists like Rachel Carson, authors like Rachel Carson and Ralph Nader raised awareness on how the, uh, the political influence and unsustainable practices and the global reach of co corporations posed dangers to society. On the regulatory side, environmental law, anti-discrimination law, anti-corruption law, consumer protection law expanded. And even on the corporate side, in the 70s, you had a rise in what's called in the US uh, stakeholder statutes, which um, claim to protect the ability of company managers to look after the interest of non-shareholder constituents. Then something really profound happened. Ronald Reagan was elected president, 1980. I think Ronald Reagan was a, was a sea change in, the, in that he embodied a new zeitgeist for, on both the public and the private side. He railed against government regulation, took pride in breaking up unions, and ushered in an, area, an era where people were intended to feel good about making money. Now, in contrast, FDR, Franklin Roosevelt, uh, had, had ushered in the New Deal saying, the test of our progress is not whether we add more to the abundance of those who have much, it is whether we provide enough for those who have too little. It's hard to imagine an American president saying that anymore. But that's what Franklin Roosevelt, who had been elected, you know, who was elected four times, said. But Reagan, in contrast, said, what I want to see above all is that this country remains a country where someone can always get rich. So that's a little bit of a change in terms of public mantra. And, and the most famous embodiment of this is the, 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 uh, the movie of Wall Street, right, with Michael Douglas, Charlie Sheen, where um, Gordon Gekko is quoted as saying, greed is, greed is good, greed is right, greed works. This also had an effect in the legal academy. And uh, Dr. Rodman has written some about this uh, to good effect. 
What we saw, in the, at least in the United States, and I think globally, during this period of time, the 80s, 90s, was the growth of the law and economics movement. Law and economics scholars uh, applied a really simplistic, libertarian, neoclassical view of economic thought to law, arguing that individuals are rational economic maximizers and act with free will, and that the, the grand purpose of law was to allow people to satisfy their preferences, primarily by in empowering private agreements and otherwise standing aside. And law and economics became especially powerful and influential in corporate law. It became, uh, the corporation was reconceptualized as a nexus of contracts, with the law called upon only to establish default rules, presumably efficient, that the parties could otherwise negotiate around. Corporate law should not dictate the details of the obligations among the parties, because everybody could bargain for themselves, whether you're an employee or community or what have you. This academic reconceptualization went hand in hand with the shift uh, among management inside companies. Duties to the company ceased to be seen as legal or professional obligations, but they were simply a function of the market. And the best way to ensure that managers did what they were told and what, what they should do was to compensate them with mechanisms that had their compensation mimic the market. So and this is the era where you had the real change uh, toward companies orienting their, their behavior toward maximization of share value and shareholder primacy. So corporate health became equated with share price, with a positive movement from quarter to quarter, then month to month, then day to day, and now nanosecond to nanosecond. So this was for about another generation, starting in the 80s, up through the early parts of this century, you had this period of contractarianism. Now, I call it contractarianism, but basically it's three phenomena. A fixation on share price, a dependence on the notion of contract as a con conceptual centerpiece of law, and third, a push for deregulation, both in financial markets, but also even using constitutional law as a force for deregulation, in a way calling back to the Lochner era. Corporations stopped, were not able to use the same parts of the Constitution that they were using in the Lochner era, but starting in the 90s primarily, corporations started to become uh, using the First Amendment, our free speech clause, to get out of regulatory obligations. More on that in a bit. And in this era, citizenship had nothing to do with what corporations were about, on either the public or the private side. The pendulums had swung back. All right. So that was about a century of intellectual history in, about, in 30 minutes or so. The next three chapters will not be that long, I promise. So let me talk some about theory. Now as these, these pendulums swing back and forth, one, th uh, one thing has been pretty constant and that's the level of theory. There's been a couple of schools of thought. On one side, you have the view that corporations are primarily about the creation of wealth for shareholders. That's known as shareholder primacy. Uh, this this uh, encapsulates that notion. Um, this has been associated with an ideologically conservative view of corporations. Corporations have one purpose. And that law and norm should channel the attention of management toward fulfilling that pur purpose. And as I mentioned, from starting in about 1980 or so, 
This has been the dominant theory in the United States and in many other jurisdictions of the world. Uh, so much so that two of our prominent scholars in the U.S. in corporate law said that uh, we were at the end of history for corporate law, and Dr. Rodman has written very critically about this assertion. So I think, and there's something to this theory, right, that the, the, the argument is that, that shareholder primacy works because uh, that is a rule that best maximizes uh, value over time, it's easy to monitor, and we can say that there's, that over time, the interest of other stakeholders coalesce with shareholders. Now, a few words of critique before I go on. First of all, it's not true that the interests of shareholders are the same as the interests of society. Right? Because of limited liability, shareholders don't share in the downside of many of decisions that go wrong. Society as a whole, though, is, are, is not a limited liability society. Somebody has to pick up the downside, as we all recognize now after the global financial crisis. The other, uh, the other quick critique is that the interests of shareholders and stakeholders do not, in fact, coalesce, even in the long term. They're different. Sometimes they coalesce. No, nobody's benefited from a, a company that fails. But just because shareholders win doesn't mean that everybody else wins. Without a mechanism for the company to internalize externalities or to share the profits with stakeholders, the trickle-down is not inevitable. But that's critique. As a matter of description, though, um, the conservative shareholder primacy sense or view of, uh, of the corporation is captured in a few statements. So, let me, so now let's get to some words, right? So this is, this is the quote that I had from before. Dodgy Ford. Business corporations organized and carried on primarily for the profit of stockholders. Another way to, uh, to say this, um, the, the uh, American Legal Institute, the principle of corporate governance, said this about a corporation a, few, uh, a couple of decades ago. Corporations should have as an objective the conduct of business activities with a view of enhancing corporate profit and shareholder gain. The, also, the assumption is that shareholders are invested in the business corporation for purely economic reasons. So companies are about shareholders, shareholders are about money. Now, the progressive view of corporations is different. Now, there, uh, there's been a minority of us, it's a vocal minority, but still a minority, that have said that corporations should be subject to a, a more robust set of obligations. That obligations should not just stop at shareholders, but should run to stakeholders as well. Indeed, we have advocated for one might call corporate citizenship. That corporations have a role to play in the public space that surpasses the financial gains for shareholders. We argue that this would make corporations better off over time and society as well. So one might say that the progressive view of corporations include the notion, includes the notion that, that there's more that can be said about a corporation's benefit to society than just what appears on the balance sheet. Another iteration of this is that there's a, an increasing uh, effort in the U.S., which I happen to be a skeptic of, but we can get to that uh, momentarily, but that um, uh, among progressive corporate lawyers, progressive corporate scholars, that there's a new form of corporate um, organization called B Corps that allow companies to say in their chartering documents that they're not just about profit, but they have other goals as well. Patagonia is probably the most um, notable B Corp in America. Is anybody wearing a Patagonia thing right there? Right. Uh, um, so it, you're wearing a B Corp, B Corp, but, and that, that may be why they're all like so much more expensive than everything else. Um, but so Patagonia is the most um, famous one in the U.S. 
Now, it's, and it's not just the scholars that have been using this. So corporations themselves use the citizenship language to describe their efforts in the public space, in the public square. You get corporate citizenship awards, you get known as the corporate citizens, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, some of this might be window dressing, but it's not all window dressing. Um, and at least the notion is that corporations who think of themselves, or groups that think of corporations as broader than just shareholders, use the word citizenship. That's what it's, how it's best described. So, starting, so, um, so this was the minority view. And then something marvelous happened. The global financial crisis, where the economy went into the, went into the ditch. Now, of course, it wasn't marvelous, right? It was horrible. People lost their jobs, people lost their homes. Uh, but the reason I say it's, it was marvelous is that it forced a lot of people to rethink what corporations were for. This assumption that the market fixed everything um, was proven false. Even Alan Greenspan, the, the former chair of our central bank, um, was forced to admit that he didn't think that, that the free market worked so well. As, you know, as the old saying is, there are few atheists in foxholes, there are few libertarians in a, in a financial crisis or in a market crash. So this, the global financial crisis forced the pendulum to swing back a bit. So there was a growing sense that the stakeholder view of corporations was taking hold. You had uh, uh, the Harvard, you know, such uh, uh, radical magazines as the Harvard Business Review saying that um, you know, maximizing shareholder value is a, is a, is, is a failure. Uh, the, the Financial Times argued that companies need a bigger and better purpose than simply maximizing shareholder value. Forbes, a Forbes article called Shareholder Primacy, the dumbest idea in the world. You know, even this uh, Joe Nocera, who is a famous uh, non-financial uh, essayist in the New York Times, said, it looks like we are in the dawn of a new mov movement, one aimed at overturning the hegemony of shareholder value. So that's where we were at the end of the first decade of the 2000s. Okay. Now, chapter three. But then something really odd happened. There were two, two cases, both at the Supreme Court, that were, were game changers. One was called Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission. And the other one was uh, called Burwell versus Hobby Lobby. So let me talk about both of these cases. Uh, Citizens United was 2010, Hobby Lobby, 2014. Neither one was a corporate law case. Citizens United was a constitutional case. Hobby Lobby was a statutory case. But they both have very big implications for this conversation. Citizens United was the case in which the Supreme Court struck down limits on corporate expenditures in, in our campaigns, saying that corporations, even for-profit corporations, have the same speech rights as human beings in the U.S. There had been limits on corporate spending and campaigns for about a century, but the court said that corporations are associations of citizens, and such associations should be able to speak and spend on, on politics as any natural person would. So that's Citizen United. Hobby Lobby was a case about, Hobby Lobby is a, um, is an arts and crafts store. Do you guys have Hobby Lobby here? It's a very Midwestern U.S. company. It's owned by a very religious family from Oklahoma. And uh, the, 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 the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, included in the regulations of, uh, 
pursuant to its enactment, a requirement that employers over a certain size give health insurance to their employees, and that, their empl and that health insurance would include contraceptive care. If you work for an employ employer, you've got to be able to go in, to the drugstore and get a pill, get the pill, or an IUD. And Hobby Lobby said, we are owned by religious people. In our religion, contraception is a sin. We should not have to be uh, providing insurance that's contrary to our, to our religious beliefs. This w came up under a statute called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, RIFRA, but it turned on the notion that, that corporations could assert claims of religious conscience. So Citizens United was about free speech. Hobby Lobby was about religious conscience. Now both being raised by ideologically conservative groups, conservative companies. And in both cases, they turn on the assertion that corporations had rights of persons. And both cases were widely criticized, especially on the left, the ideological left. saying that the, corp the corporations are rewriting the Constitution, they're occupying um, uh, personhood uh, status, uh, the corporate personhood was, was squashing democracy, and this huge backlash, you know, in a way, they have a point, right? These companies were using citizenship rights to undermine the citizenship rights, their citizenship obligations as a matter of corporate governance. But what's interesting about this uh, ideologically is how it created a complete ideological flip in how people started talking about corporate obligations. Remember this, the conservative view? A corporation should have it as objective, the conduct of business activities with a view of enhancing, that's, that's, the, that's the, the conservative view of corporations. That was cited by John Paul Stevens, the most liberal person on the Supreme Court at the time, in dissent in Citizens United. So this, in Citizens United, was the progressive view of corporations. Corporations are about business, not about free speech, said Justice Stevens. Stevens also quoted Adam Winkler saying that shareholders are invested in the business corporation for purely economic reasons. So again, the old conservative view of shareholders, that they're only about money, was used as an argument to limit corporate speech rights. And there was, you know, that, that makes sense as an argument. Corporations are about money, they shouldn't be in the public square, we should keep them isolated. In the Hobby Lobby case, the court, in the, the lower court uh, that held against the, the company, said that corporations are created to make money. You're, you can't be about religion, you're about money. Of course, that's, that was the conservative view of corporations before, but it was the progressive view in Hobby Lobby to try to keep corporations from asserting religious freedom rights. And on the other hand, the conservative view in Hobby Lobby was that Corporations should be about more than just money. We could be about religion too. In fact, when, we, when it got to the Supreme Court, um, uh, again, here's another quote from, from the lower courts, citing benefit corporations. Right? So the, the progressive idea of, of allow, allowing corporations to be more, more than just about profit is, was being used in these cases as an argument for why they could be religious. I kept worrying that I was going to be cited in, like, in one of these like, uh, conservative opinions, uh, uh, holding in favor of, because I, I, these kinds of quotes are the things that I've been writing for 20 years. But um, one, of, one of our, uh, Lynn Stout was actually quoted in one of the, one of the papers, uh, which was, again, it was like it, we were all flipped on this. 
And once we got to the Supreme Court case in Hobby Lobby, you had Justice Alito, probably the most, or maybe the second most conservative justice on the Supreme Court now, saying that corporations don't have to be about profit all the time. They can be about other things. Uh, and, and again, citing the benefit corporation as an example of why corporations could be about other things. Meanwhile, the liberals in the U.S., those on the ideological left, are starting to, uh, to champion shareholder rights, common calls, a big, uh, really sort of left-leaning group in the United States, now has this project to strengthen shareholder rights. The Brennan Center for Justice is now advocating like, the protection of shareholders. And you can see why, right, like, like this is an argument uh, why Citizens United should be cabined or limited. But it's certainly weird, right? The world is uh, upside down a bit. So what do we do? Chapter 4, right on time. So what should we do? So here are a couple things that we should not do. All right. And here, for the next couple of slides, I'm going to criticize my friends on the left in the U.S. who have been opposing these two cases. What is, what is the first thing you think about when I talk about Citizens United or Hobby Lobby, mostly Citizens United? What do, what do people on the left say? Money is not speech. Right? This argument may not be as prominent here, but it certainly is in the in the U.S., it's, it's the number one sign on, you know, if you're occupying Wall Street, uh, the, this is sign number one or sign number two. Money is not speech. The argument is you can, the Supreme Court should not have struck down limits on spending because spending is not speech. S limits on spending and politics do not violate the First Amendment because money is not speech. I, do, I believe that Citizens United was wrongly decided. They should not have struck down limits on spending in campaigns. But it is not because money is not speech. Of course money can be speech. Of course it can be. Or at least it's enough speech that it, that it should raise First Amendment issues. Imagine for a moment that a wild, wacky, despotic, man becomes President of the United States. Imagine for a moment that that man has his own party in control of both of the houses of the of U.S. Congress. Imagine for a moment such a counterfactual situation. Imagine that Congress passing a law saying that no one can contribute to Planned Parenthood. Would that violate the free speech rights of Americans who want to contribute to Planned Parenthood? Of course it would. We can't say, the answer to that would not be, it's not, it doesn't restrict uh, people's speech rights because money is not speech. Of course money can be speech. Now the reason why I think Citizen United is wrong is not because money is not speech, but because there are other compelling interests that weigh against those interests and especially in a campaign setting. We should not let people with so much more money dominate the airwaves, dominate the arguments, dominate the discussion, skew the debate. But that's not about money not being speech. That's about other norms and other values that you put in the balance. What is another thing that, that you hear on the left in the U.S.? You hear that... Um, Corporations are not people. You know, you should have constitutional rights for people, not corporations. Again, this, this comes from a good place, um, but it's wrong. Of course corporations should have constitutional rights. Of course corporations should have a role in the public square, at least some of the time. Of course, as I've mentioned, corporations have economic interests 
and ideological biases that do not always correlate with the public interest. But their voice, in fact, matters, Sometime, at least some of the time. The New York Times is a for-profit company with shareholders. Of course the New York Times has First Amendment rights. Of course. And in fact, even as, perhaps especially in a Trump era, corporations might provide a break on the political pendulum's rightward swing. So corporations have to be more diverse, have to be more globally focused, have to be, think about the long term in ways that <laughs> the homogeneous, distressed, insular tribes that voted for Trump are not. Case in point, right? The, who, the, the, new, the new cover girl? Where's the hijab? Have you seen this commercial for Amazon where the priest and the imam have tea by each other, knee pads? Uh, the Coca-Cola commercial that ran during the Super Bowl had people singing America the Beautiful from a diverse range of languages. Now this, this, is, this provides a, a counterpoint in these eras where, in this era that we need. And it's not just on marketing. Corporations such as American Airlines and Apple are among the most vocal opponents of the anti-transgender law that we have in North Carolina now. A group of leading businesses like General Electric and American Express filed a brief last year in the United States Supreme Court in favor of affirmative action. Walmart spoke out against a religious freedom law that was being adopted in Arkansas, where it's based, that would allow companies to discriminate against gays and lesbians. Now this is not to say that, that companies should have the same rights as humans. But it is to say that the real worry is not that the corporations speak, but for whom they speak. And that is a function of corporate law, not constitutional law. So here's an idea. If we were to improve corporate personhood and corporate citizenship as a matter of corporate law, we would need to worry less about corporate citizenship and personhood as a matter of constitutional law. And ironically, the language of Citizens United might, sh might show us the way. The, what the court said in Citizens United was that corporations are associations of citizens. Now, there's nothing in corporate law that makes that real. Justice Kennedy just doesn't know much about the way businesses actually work. But what if we took that as a way to move forward? If companies were more like associations of citizens, then we would worry less about them being engaged in the public square. We can broaden fiduciary duties to make managers care more, require them to care more, about non-shareholder stakeholders. We could institute a system of real enforceable fiduciary duties that would make them care. We could change how corporate corporations are governed, the structure of corporate governance, to include stakeholder interest. We could have companies look more like uh, companies in Europe. I didn't know this when I was in law school, that uh, companies in Germany, for example, you have half the board of directors being elected by the employees. BMW has half the board of directors employee uh, elected. Mercedes-Benz, Siemens. These are not like fly-by-night companies that are going to fail at any moment. Right? And actually what that does when you have a company that sees itself as being more than just about shareholder gain, they're managed differently. They're managed with a more of a long-term view. And in an odd way, and I'm, um, as, I, as I close here, as, I, as an odd way, this would make corporations more like people. If corporations were more like people, we, could, we would worry about them less. And what do I mean by that? 
human beings routinely manage a multitude of interests. I'm a parent, I'm a spouse, I'm a teacher, I'm a writer, I'm a son, I'm a brother, I'm a friend. I've got to do all that well. Only the rare oddball acts as if only one thing matters. And only the rarest of oddballs acts as if that one thing is money. We might, you know, I might have known maybe one person in my entire life that acted that way, and he was a weirdo. People don't act that way. Humans have consciences. Now, corporations obviously do not, and corporate law does not require that of them. Left to themselves, they will end up acting like that one oddball, that, where money is the only thing that's important. The best way to constrain corporations, in my view, is to make them act more like people, to require them to sign on to a more robust social contract and govern themselves more pluralistically, to take seriously stakeholder theory. If we can mimic the traits of humanity within the corporate form, we would all be better off. So corporations are people too. They can be, we can ask them to do more. They can take on broader obligations of citizenship. And if they look more democratic internally, their involvement in the public space will be much less problematic. It might even do some good. Corporations are people too. They should act like it. Thank you very much. So I'm happy to take questions or comments or we can all go have a beer or both. Yeah, I think that's a great point. So one of, the, one of the things that happens, right, when you have shareholder primacy is that shareholders, especially these days, are really short-term uh, investors. In the U.S., the turnover is about um, uh, typical sh uh, turnover for publicly traded companies is four times a year. So each, each share is bought and sold four times a year. And for smaller companies, it's even more. So if you're a shareholder, you know, um, six months from now is a really long time. Now, if you work for Patagonia, six months is not that long, right? Um, you, and so if once you, my view on this is once you uh, import the views of employees, communities, and into the uh, governance fabric, the company transforms into a company that, that thinks more in the long term. The problem with that, obviously, is that in the marketplace, if they're the only ones doing it, they're competing at a detriment in the short term against companies that are competing only in the short term, especially on, in, in the capital markets. So that's one of the reasons why I'm skeptical of the B Corp form, because um, unless everybody is for, every company is forced to look at the short term, there's going to be a short term disadvantage for those looking at the long term. So that's why I think this should be done uh, more, more broad-based broad and, and not just um, voluntarily like the B Corp um, uh, form allows it to. Yeah. Question. The, the corporations are people too. Um, I'm thinking of changing it a bit, saying corporations are governments too. And I say that because mm -hmm. of um, the roles corporations
their role and the power that they have amassed by the virtue of their size and their resources um, might get us anywhere in this discussion. I'll just give you quickly an example. The Australians, uh, the Australian Commonwealth government, the federal government, uh, struck some years ago what they call the Commonwealth Model Limited Rules to govern the conduct of governments and litigation, the theory being that the government had a higher duty because of the power it took into the courtroom when it was involved in litigation. And some tried to make the argument that given how the role of corporations have shifted and that they are in, in some ways governments that perhaps some of this yeah, so, so there's been um, some scholarship along that front in the sense that, uh, in, in two ways. One is that, uh, this is a sort of a minor, uh, minor point and then a larger point. A minor point is that increasingly corporations are asked to do the things that governments used to do. So that they're now in charge of prisons or they're now in charge of your uh, school bus routes or, or, or what have you. And so once you, once, you, once you have companies taking on the role or the behaviors or the activities of governments, then they, it strikes me that that's, uh, it just follows that they should be asked to do more. No, but brilliant means 80 years ago, their point was more a theoretical point, uh, which I think is what you're saying, which is that, that once corporations become a certain size, they have public impact that rivals that of governments. And that was you know, one of the things I started with uh, this afternoon, that it's the, um, the power there is so great, and this is brilliant means, uh, that the power there is so great, the invisible hand is not gonna work. So the, the argument for that there's public, uh, there needs to be public oversight, public uh, regulation, is, um, uh, is even more powerful. Another way to think about that uh, is that the power of corporations are done by way of concession from the government. It goes back to the, concession, old, the old concession theory of corporations. Now, the reason why I'm thinking about corporations as people, just as a different riff on that, it, um, because of this notion that uh, we, we want to push back against the, this notion that corporations are, are not people, I think we'd be better off if we thought of them as, because first of all, we're better off if we think of them as legal persons because it's easier to keep them, to hold them accountable for things if we can sue them and they can be sued. But secondly, I think uh, it's easy for us to think about each of us individually of having multitude, a multitude of obligations. And, but when it comes to corporations, we say, oh, that's impossible. A corporation can only have one thing. Otherwise, we won't know whether they're doing a good job. That's just false. Like you, uh, universities have more than one thing that they do, and it's not impossible to tell whether a university is doing a good job or not. Uh, so, so, that's, so that's my, um, that's why rhetorically I'm, I'm focusing more on the, the corporations as, as people notion. Yeah. Um. So when you're speaking about the possibilities of corporations contributing to sort of a, you know, a wide variety of positive, excuse me, positive causes, um, it seems to me that that's, that's a pretty big category. And within that category, there's some pretty simple things like after school programs and you know, keeping highways clean. And then there's climate change, which is a lot more complicated. Yeah. So in that sort of category of obligations, I'm wondering if you could speak to the idea of, you know, there'd be lots of corporations who are willing to do perhaps things that are closer to the first end, and not so willing to do things that are closer to that. Yeah, what, what an interesting um, question, right? Because, uh, and I'm starting to do some work on this actually, uh, because, um, not to get too technical, but, but because of discount rates. <laughs> uh, and I'll, uh, let me flag that as part of my answer, I'll come back to it. But you're absolutely right that uh, companies are, are much better at doing the, the simple things. You know, you want to contribute to our fundraiser? Yes, we can do that, right? You want to, um, uh, my wife was just pointing out the other day, that we were watching, um, um, you know, some show on TV, and I, it was um, 
General Electric that was uh, uh, having this big commercial about prioritizing the interest of women scientists. And her, my wife's take was, wow, all these companies are, are rushing in to monetize the frustration and anger of the left. Like, okay, so, you know, that, that's good, you know, so at least you know, let's take it, we'll take it while we can get it. Um, you know, the Audi commercial, the Audi made some, uh, uh, made some news when, with their commercial during the Super Bowl where it was all about girl, this dad talking about um, his daughter, whether he's going to tell, be able to, have to tell his daughter that uh, she's never going to make as much as the, as the boys in their class and all this kind of stuff. And that's Audi. Um, but where it gets hard, right, is the long-term stuff. Two things. First of all, it's hard because companies themselves are so short-term oriented that they don't care. The present value, and this goes back to the, um, the discount rates, the present value of environmental calamity 500 years from now is zero from a financial perspective. Now, we might care because we're going to, you know, we hope to have descendants living then, but a company, if you, if you do the normal discount rate, and even if it's like a gazillion, trillion, bazillion dollars 500 years from now, like the present value of that, if you do the discount rate of 5% a year, is, you know, it's, it's less than the money you have in your pocket right now. So the company's not going to care. So how do we get a company to care about that kind of thing? Even 25 years from now or 50 years from now. My view is that the, the one way for them not to care is for the, for, to, to tell them that the only thing that matters is share price. We'll guarantee that they won't care because they'll bury it in their balance sheets. Shareholders won't care because they're all, the shareholders are all oriented at the short term. But if we have a shot at it at all, it's going to come by way of, of forcing the companies to, to listen to stakeholders other than shareholders. It may, it may not be perfect, and it may be that, you know, that, uh, it may be that, uh, that my idea will not solve everything. Uh, we might have to have regulation that overlays this. But I think it will do more than what we're doing now. But I, uh, the, the, now, the last point on that point, on that issue. Uh, there's a growing sense in the U.S. that um, especially energy companies should be subject to suit for fraud over their um, disclosures about climate change. I think this is an interesting area of possible litigation for, for, um, for shareholder activists and, and other activists. Because it may be that Exxon, for example, uh, ha, you know, has every interest in the world to, um, to be a climate change denier. Because they've got trillions of dollars of oil reserves still in the ground that uh, plummet in value if climate change becomes a real worry. So they have, so they, if, if, and, so, and they're carrying the value of, those, of that oil, those oil reserves on their balance sheets. So they don't want people to believe, believe climate change because then their assets fall. And so it may be that they've been engaged, and so they're starting to become uh, shareholder activist suits now, saying that Exxon de denying climate change or funding climate change deniers is actually engaging in fraudulent behavior in order to prop up their, uh, the value of their assets. Thank you. Please. Yeah, I mean, I think your, your proposal on a sort of more relationally figured sense of rights uh, for a corporation, uh, I think mean, that brings uh, an interesting comparison given that there's the U.S. Canada split, yeah. uh, which is more related to our, our sort of charter constitutional space. Um, but given that the corporation has the capacity, even in the positive sense, to just be an association of citizens, if those citizens conceive of their constitutional relationship, their relationship to their rights as hyper individualized, more so than relational, uh, in that they're, uh, again, uh, uh, long experts in you know, constitutional litigation in the US, uh, but at least a structural sense that there's a more individualized relationship to your constitutional rights than there is a relational one. Does that problematize how this proposal might uh, operate in the US? Yes, interesting, uh, interesting thought. Uh, 
yeah, I'm not sure how to deal with that yet. I, I, you're right that, that uh, in the US, constitutional rights are so individualized, and, right, and, and they operate as a, um, uh, when they operate, they operate as a, um, as a waiver of, of obligation in a way. Like I don't have to, um, I don't have to um, um, say the Pledge of Allegiance because I have a First Amendment right not to. Now, uh, corporations are now saying, just like a school child doesn't have to stand up and say the Pledge of Allegiance because they have a First Amendment right to do it, the corporations are now saying, we don't have to print our, our warning labels on our cigarette packages because we have a First Amendment right not to say it. So, so you're, you're right to, that, um, to raise those kinds of, of issues because, at least under the U.S., most of our rights are negative rights as opposed to positive rights. We don't have a right to, uh, constitutional right to health care. We don't have a right to, constitutional right to water. We don't have a constitutional right to education. Uh, we have a right not to be treated unfair, uh, unequally. We have a right not to be treated in ways that are um, contrary to our fundamental rights. So I, I, I see the issue and I think um, in a way because, uh, just off the top of my head, because we have that kind of scheme of constitutional rights, I think it's even more important to get the corporate governance stuff right, correct, because otherwise corporations are going to start to try to stand in the shoes of individuals and um, uh, and, and claiming these individualized rights in a, uh, for a corporate entity in a way in ways that, that don't seem to be right. And this goes back to the previous question about Exxon. Uh, the, the Attorney General of Massachusetts is suing Exxon for uh, fraud about their disclosures on climate change. Exxon has, has responded to the lawsuit saying they have a First Amendment right to um, not disclose their internal communications about climate change. So they're saying we're like the school kid who doesn't want to say the Pledge of Allegiance. So I think that's, that's the problem. I'm going to raise this because it's something that we've been talking about in, in our business associations class. And I think it relates to, to your talk as well. One of the problems we talk about coercion, coercion of corporations are trying to force corporations to act in different ways, and that is always the negative side to it, the, the penalty enforcement. So one thing that we were talking about, and we're just actually coincidentally at the point where we're talking about corporate personality, so your, your lecture is really timely, which is great, uh, is we talked a bit about the idea of finding a corporation or how can you punish corporation when, for example, if you levy a fine, that fine gets internalized and passed down such that it doesn't harm the corporation really at all. And then there are other issues, certainly theoretical issues, that if you, if you throw a director in jail for some kind of corporate offense, it runs afoul of corporate theory when you're talking about separation between directors and the corporation as an entity. So we, we start talking about that a little bit. We're, we're going to continue talking about as well, but how would you address that related to the topic that you're talking about when you're talking about the ability of coercing corporations and maybe focusing a bit more on the negative side and, and some of the issues that might be there that maybe <coughs> are still highly problematic in terms of trying to force or, or uh, coerce certain kinds of behavior? Yeah, so uh, two answers. First, I think a lot can be done structurally. Right? Um, I think the best way to enforce a fiduciary duty that's more robust is to make the board look more like the, uh, all the investors in the company. And so when I say investors, I include employees, include communities. So if you had a stakeholder board, you wouldn't need to worry, you wouldn't have to worry so much about having strict fiduciary duties enforced by, by courts because it would, it would take the, um, the, the marketplace and in effect import it into the board. I think, so there's structural protections. In terms of, uh, of how do I make fiduciary, even if that were, were not to happen, how would I make fiduciary duties real? I think one of the big problems in the way U.S. law works is the, uh, it, it, we give such deference to the, to the business judgment of directors. And it's under you know, the business judgment rule 
uh, says that courts shouldn't upset the decisions of directors if they were well informed, even if they were negligent, even if they were grossly negligent. That makes no sense to me. Like we punish doctors who are grossly negligent, or even negligent. We punish um, car designers who are negligent. They cause the the rollover of cars. It's only in this area of business where we say courts don't have the expertise to know whether to um, to hold a director liable. I, I had a debate with Frank Easterbrook last year. Frank Easterbrook's one of the iconic scholars um, who founded the law and economics movement. And he said, you know, judges shouldn't be adjudicating these claims. We don't know anything about business. He's a federal judge. He does, you know, he, he adjudicates claims about uh, whether DNA strands are, are, are patentable or not. Like, it's not that, you know, most business decisions are not that complicated. And you can tell by taking evidence whether it's, uh, they've been done negligently or not. So I think, um, so I think that's a long-winded way of saying the key here is to adjudicate these claims in court like, they, like we adjudicate any other kind of claim. Was a, was a person negligent? Were they reckless? Then hold them accountable. And may, so maybe what that means is these indemnity and greedy, um, agreements are too protective of, of directors as well as the, the uh, baseline business judgment rule. Yeah. Well, there's a reason why every hedge fund is operating in Bermuda because they don't want to pay taxes, so they avoid. Right. So, I, so uh, I think the the short answer is that aren't that the U.S. is one of the most protective uh, jurisdictions in the world of of corporate management, one of the most um, and of shareholder uh, primacy. So there are not that many places that they could go, uh, and. We're the, the U.S. is the outlier in this respect, for the most part. The other thing to say is that, um, you know, the corporations, they might be able to move their paper, but corporations aren't really willing to move their headquarters and their facilities. One of the anomalies of U.S. law is that, uh, you know, there's, there's literally a filing cabinet in Wilmington, Delaware, probably the size of this table, that is the headquarters of most of the Fortune 500. You know, there's, you know how many Fortune 500 companies are based in Delaware? One. Because they can just, you know, they can claim by filing a piece of paper in Delaware that their home is Delaware. That's total nonsense. They shouldn't be able to do that. That's not the rule in Europe. It's not the rule anywhere. Um, so, so, so the the longer answer to you, first, the first answer is they're not going to, you're not going to actually see many people flee. The second answer, I believe, is that uh, if they start, I don't think they're, um, if they start fleeing, there are, there are some constraints on that. They're not going to want to pick up their headquarters and thousands of employees and move them to Bermuda. I'd like to move to Bermuda, uh, but they probably won't. Thanks to everybody for your attention and, and for, your, for your invitation to come. I'd like to thank uh, Ken for uh wonderful and very provocative talk. And uh, again, thank you and a little token of Great. our appreciation. Thank you very much.